Right. Okay. So so far, uh, in last week we were looking at uh, theories of the physics block standing. The basic idea is that so again I will start with uh, that there is something called a, at, a, at in a scale at very high to the standing model, which is called the uh, Planck scale. Okay, here and then we are sitting somewhere here, which is the big scale. Okay, which is the scale of the standard model. Now, so what we have tried to do is to introduce a new symmetry to protect the Higgs mass because we said that the Higgs mass is sensitive to the highest scale in the theory, and the highest scale in the theory is the Planck. How do we show that uh, the highest scale in the theory is the Planck? So how do you show? You meaning you just take an effect reaction just by the Higgs potential. And write an effective action uh, uh, L essentially. So if you write an effective action for the Higgs, okay, and uh, integrate it out, okay, B phi on the action essentially S of Higgs, and integrate it out between the scales say and flag. To be scale, integrate out all the heavy modes essentially up to the plan. And when you do, you see the effector action. What does it do? It replaces mu square to the plan scale due to quantum correction. So if you do a one loop effector action, when you do a one loop, one loop effector action, what it does, okay, it does this calculation. Uh, when you do this calculation, one loop for full one loop effect. Calculation. If you want to see this explicit calculation, you can see it in uh, effective Lagrangians of the standard model. This you can do on your own. You can use Preskin or something. But it's also done explicitly in a book by Dobard and company. So it's a good book because it also does theorem theories and various other things essentially. Okay? So it's useful. So if one, at some point I when I go to uh, composite Higgs models or something, so you need this kind of thing. So it's a book called Effective Lagrangians of the Standard Model. If you need a copy of it, I have it. I used to have it. Now I don't know if I have it in my office or not. But I used to have it by the word at all. Where this calculation is explicitly done. So how to derive the path integral effective action. Or it's also done in Prescan. So you can do it in Prescan, but not with the cutoff. So when you see that, so there are, so the way you, the way you uh, uh, deal with the hierarchy problem is that uh, you introduce a symmetry, and when you, you introduce a symmetry, what it is it do? It introduces new particles here. So typically M super symmetry. So you can do other kinds of symmetries also. We will see them later on. Okay. These supersymmetry, from now on, what we will see supersymmetry, uh, okay, supersymmetry is a weakly coupled. Because it's perturbative in nature. It's perturbative in nature. So it is perturbative in nature. You can have other symmetries also. They are not picky coupled. Okay? You can have other symmetries like uh, you can have composite models, essentially composite Higgs models. Which have chiral symmetries sort of things which are protected in the Higgs. Okay? They are strongly coupled. Extensions. So, 
standard model. Strongly coupled means these series become non perturbative at certain resonances. They have couplings which are order 1, so they are very large couplings. Whereas here, supersymmetry is very nice, it's Reynolds Good theory, okay? It is weakly coupled, so it gives you all the features and everything. But strongly coupled extensions are essentially like composite phase. Another famous model which is called Technicolor takes less models. And within the class of strongly coupled theories, also come extra dimension. These are theories which are extra space time dimensions, space time. So at some point, maybe after extra dimensions, I'll go to technical because technical is so, sort of right now in a very bad shape because Higgs is found and everything. So we don't need technical models to group it. But at some point, I can cover it. I mean, uh, especially it's interesting because you can calculate something called S parameter in this thing. A little interesting. So this is actually ruled out by something called S parameter. So we'll see how whether we study this or not as of now. So right now, these are sort of in a bad shape. But there are extensions of this which are called working technicolor and so on so, extended technicolor and so on so, but with the discovery of the Higgs, these class of models are in a very, very bad shape. So we don't really have to. These are these fall under something on the dynamical breaking of supersymmetry. Or DSB models. So we have interactions which break the symmetry essentially. So if you want uh, one of the first papers on this uh, essentially by Weinberg and company and also Suskin and company essentially. So you, those papers you should, everybody should read. Everybody should read those papers by Weinberg and company essentially. No, it's not all, it's by Weinberg Suskin. These are typically not covered in most of the physics on standard models lectures nowadays, but historically they are very important and one should cover those ideas as well. So the other ones are uh, essentially composite Higgs. Here the idea is that Higgs is a pion. Essentially Higgs is a pion. So Higgs comes out as a pseudo boson boson of some larger symmetry essentially. Okay. Then there are something called the little Higgs. Pion, so essentially it has chiral dynamics. So then there are other classes of models which are also assume some symmetries. Here, what is called the twin Higgs models, which also has an extra standard model, completely standard model. It has a mirror sector. And the mirror sector and the standard model sector, so it is essentially SM, SM prime or a mirror sector. And only the Higgs sector is shared between the mirror sector and the standard model sector. So if we, if we go into it at some point and they have some symmetry, here also at one loop. All these models become strongly coupled after one loop. Little Higgs, twin Higgs, composite Higgs. So here they essentially try to solve the hierarchy problem only at the one loop. At two loop, the theories become again strongly coupled. 
So for example, Twin Higgs is also very similar to the supersymmetry in which it cancels one loop diagram's contribution to the Higgs, but then it cancels uh, the loop contributions of same spin particles, not opposite, opposite spin particles, okay? So it cancels uh, same spin particles. But X, in all these models, you have extra particles, extra particles, extra, uh, extra particles, symmetry is the main thing. You're always trying to invent some symmetry. And in that process, you're putting in some sort of new particles here, around the big scale. Instead of supersymmetry, you'll have something else. Top partners, twin partners, something or the other, extra Higgses, something or the other you have. But extra dimensions are completely different. They try to solve the problem not by introducing new particles or new symmetry, but actually bringing the Planck scale down all the way up to the scale. Okay, philosophically they are completely different compared to okay any of these things essentially. So the basic idea in right in this class of models which we will be dealing with today. Standardization theories you bring down the plan scale all the way to the big scale. So you are reducing the fundamental cutoff in your theory. And sitting at temporary in chair, but we have something else which you call Planck star, he is close to him. That's the basic idea. That this is your fundamental cutoff of your theory, so your Planck scale has come down all the way. Big scale, very close to him. That's the basic idea. So there are two problems with this thing. How do you achieve this? How do you achieve this? To achieve this, you need to introduce extra space dimensions. This argument works. Second, once you use extra space dimensions, how are you going to put standard model formulas into this? Gauge fields, everything. Okay? How are you going to construct the standard model? So these are the two things, uh, that's the basic idea, essentially. these are the two things one has to do. So if you want to reduce the Planck scale down the, all the way, 
speed scale. So you achieve this by introducing a space dimension. Okay, so now let's try to understand this part. And then we'll try to do the second part. So, is it possible at all to reduce the Planck scale? Okay. Is it possible to reduce the Planck scale? So, it is historically known that it is possible to do electromagnetic theory in extra dimensions. Okay. So, people have done electromagnetic theory in extra dimensions. Okay. In the 1920s. So, they were trying to unify gravity and electromagnetic theory essentially. In the 1920s, they knew. Okay, so if we have one extra dimension, essentially, they could get unification of uh, gravity and extra dimension. So their idea was like this: so suppose if we have a metric G V nu in five dimensions. Okay, this is G V nu five. This can be written in terms of G V nu four dimensions. Okay, and then. Okay, this is 4 by 4. Here you have a vector here in you, and here you have a scalar. So if we decompose it, just tensor analysis, just tensor analysis. Okay, so <coughs> this is 1 by 4 again. Okay, this was a new transpose sort of thing, and then this is a half pipe. So this a mu you can identify with the a mu of the electromagnetic field. That was their idea essentially. That we, this a mu you can identify with the electromagnetic field. So this g mu nu is a four-dimensional gravitational metric, but five-dimensional gravitational metric is a symmetric field in five by five. So this is a five by five matrix. So this is a mu sitting here, and then we have one scalar field, extra scalar field. Okay. With some extra one scalar field, you can try to unify gravitational and electromagnetic field. See, many people try to unify gravity and electromagnetic field because they have very, very similar structures. Essentially. Both of them are radial forces, both of them are long range forces. Okay, So, they have if you have a point source or something, so people try to unify them. So, the, so, you, so mathematically, you can write them in similar structure if you have some sort of a, uh, uh, a five dimensional extra space essentially. So, what is this extra space is the question. Okay, this theory was not successful at that point essentially. Okay, there were many issues with it. Okay, but anyway, this was a starting point. Okay? This was a starting point. So, but then Leave alone gravity, we can let and look at Maxwell's equations in extra dimensions. So Maxwell's equations hold true in higher dimensions. So they are valid in higher dimensions. So, of which we will just take one particular thing, 
which is essentially the bar slot. So the Gauss law is just comes as essentially uh, del dot e. Now this I write it in terms of uh, uh, okay del at zero i del x i. Now this is valid, this is valid in all dimensions, okay, Gauss law is valid in all dimensions because essentially what it tells you is that the flux of the electricity is equivalent to the point density of the point source, density of the point source is converted by surface essentially whatever it is. According to dimensions, only i will increase. Zero will keep only one time direction. Okay, will keep only one time direction, and space directions we keep it easy. Because it's a radial force, you just have to worry about hypercells surrounding it. Okay, so um, the Gauss law doesn't require that this uh, extra dimensions. Should be compactified or anything. Okay, we had to work. We'll do it for gravity. Okay, as far as Gauss law is concerned, you have a point source, and you are only worried about the radial, how much distance you are. So you are only looking at hypercells around it. Okay, you are just looking at how much spherical cells you are So you have some point source. So what is the flux around it? Could be radial dimensions essentially because you are only worried about the radial. Electric field force is only radial. So there is no problem essentially. These need not be compactified or anything essentially. But of course, for if you consider uh, uh, gravity or something, because we don't see those things, we have to think about compactification. I will come to that in a second, but anyway, but let's just do arithmetic. Okay, just So, what we can write in some, some dimensions, say for example, so if you have three space time dimensions, okay, so this is some boundary in three dimensions, compact for dimensions, volume, okay, times then dot e is equal to d volume <coughs> root so you can use the divergence theorem and get it now the important point is that this surface b3 uh, um, Okay, let me define what is B. Uh, I'm just using notation of Z back here essentially because I find it. Uh, so suppose if you have X1, uh, I find it useful. 
some surface R, say for example, because we are really worried about uh, this thing. This surface is a ball, essentially. This is a ball, that means it contains all the thing inside, inside this ball. Okay? But now, if I put it as equal to, if I put it as equal to, it just becomes a two-dimensional surface. Because you are computing only the flux on the surface. When you are computing the flux, because you are only looking at the divergence, right, essentially, you are only looking at the divergence, so it means you are only looking at the flux on the tangential surface, essentially. Okay? So that means, that just becomes x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square is equal to r square. So this is one dimensional less, it's a two sphere. It's a two sphere. It's a three ball and a two sphere, okay? <laughs> okay, I don't know whether this guy is current, okay? It's a two sphere. So when you're computing the flux, what matters is this two sphere, the surface Okay, you all agree with this point. Okay. Yeah, it's a true sphere, but we cannot say it is a like two dimensional. It's not in a plane. It it is three dimensional. It is two sphere embedded in a three dimensional sphere, but it's two dimensional. So the divergence theorem uh, we convert it into a using slope. Yeah. Yeah, into a surface. Right, surface. That's it. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're saying it's two-dimensional, right? Mm -hmm. As long as you live on the surface, it's two-dimensional. Like mm. As long as you are living on the surface, you cannot see the third dimension. So yeah, yeah uh, three Right, right. You're sitting on the surface; it's two-dimensional. Okay. So, in general, uh, so this formula can be. Expand it for any dimension essentially. So instead of three dimensions, you can put x1, x2, x3, x4, xd. Here. So if we have a three dimensional surface, this becomes one dimensional less so. One dimensional less. The surface becomes one dimensional. Okay? So if we have three dimensional surface, it becomes one dimensional surface. So this is x1 square, x2 square, xd square is equal to r square, less than or equal to r square. And then we have x1 square plus x2 square plus xd square is equal to r square, this I call it as a surface of dimension d minus 1. This is some surface of dimension d. Now you can compute a general formula for surfaces and the volumes. You can compute a general formula. It is given in terms of some gamma functions. Okay? You can look into how do you compute it. You can just write in terms of slices of space. It's very simple. It's very simple. If you want to look into this book by Zwieback, essentially, it does it. It's very elementary. Okay, you can do it. And when you do that, you end up with a formula uh, for d dimensions. Okay, is equal to. I found it very instructive. So there's a reason. I am doing this in for Maxwell's equations also. I like it very much. <coughs> this is electric field in d dimensions is equal to gamma d by 2 by 2 pi d by 2 q by r power.
In a way, you can rewrite it as E of R into volume of D is equal to Q by R power D minus 1. And this volume factor is nothing but this. You can calculate this volume factor essentially. This volume factor is given by 2 by D by 2 by gamma D by D. Okay. Volume of S D minus 1. So for example, or S, how do I write it? D minus 1. So the electric field has a volume suppression as well as that there is an increase in the dimensions of the R sitting here. Say for example, if you go D is equal to so the number of dimensions if you start increasing, say for example, if D is equal to, so we are sitting in D, 0 plus D dimensions. 0 is per time. Okay. So for example, if we are sitting in 0 plus 3, this is just mu q by r square, which is your standard formula, essentially q by r square. Now if you are sitting in 0 plus 4, it gives you q by r q. Okay, one extra dimension, it increases the length by one r factor. Okay, it increases the length by one r factor and a volume factor given by this one. So gamma 2 is equal to 2 factorial, 2 essentially. Uh, gamma 2 is equal to 1 factorial, sorry. N minus 1 factorial essentially. And then 2 pi sub factor. So, but the important thing is that it increases the length dimensions of the electric field. It increases by length dimension by one, one factor. As you go in higher and higher dimensions, you are increasing the length by one dimension. So, the electric field will uh, fall faster? Full fast, faster. Full fall faster. Okay. As you increase the volume, it becomes more and more diluted. Electric field will become more and more diluted. And this happens actually if you write a gauge theory, okay, in extra dimension, the gauge coupling reduces from four dimensions to five dimensions by a volume factor. So if you write QD in five dimensions, okay, if we, I think we'll do that example exactly like what we used with supersymmetry. If you write QD in five dimensions, the gauge coupling reduces by a volume factor, by a volume factor, which is given by the length of the wave. Okay, so we can write the Gauss law and the Poisson's equation, so on, so essentially. Now. We want to do the same thing for gravity. Okay? Can we write a quote unquote Gauss law for gravity? Okay. Do gravitational potentials satisfy this kind of a So can you write a gravitational potential? Now, here the argument is, I am not using general relativity arguments, okay, I am just using Newtonian law, okay, I am just using arguments based on Newtonian gravity, okay, what I am going to tell you is that Newtonian gravitational constant is equivalent to 1 by m Planck essentially, okay, the Planck scale, okay, and so 
I am saying that Newtonian gravitational constant will also reduce in higher dimensions. Okay. And that's how I can increase the number of dimensions and reduce the gravitational coupling. That's how I can bring down the Planck's constant all the way up to the space. Yeah, instead of with uh, E electric field, I write a Gauss law with the electromagnetic field, with a gravitational field. So you have F is equal to G M1 M2 by R square. Similarly, you can write the gravitational potential is equal to gravitational field divergence of some gravitational uh, potential or del square of a gravitational potential because just like Poisson's law, I can write something similar essentially. Potential is some gravitational potential. Okay, I can write it in this particular fashion. Now, this V is your familiar V. Um, minus G M by R. Okay. Nothing else. This G is some uh, corresponding to the gravitational field, electromagnetic field. Uh, just like electromagnetic field, you can also have electric field, you can also have gravitational field. Okay. Now I do the same thing. Now I do the same thing by saying that this is also valid in all dimensions. It's also valid in all dimensions. So correspondingly I'll write okay correspondingly I'll write del square V G equal to four pi G I didn't write it in terms of dimensions here. So this is corresponding to the charge density. I am putting a matter density. Corresponding to matter density. Okay. I am just writing Poisson's law. Okay. Del square V is equal to gravitational potential, scalar potential, this scalar potential, and then four pi G. Up to here, everybody agree with me. There is nothing new I written. I just match the dimensions essentially. Now I make the statement that I increase the dimensions. And this is valid. So the gravitational Gauss law is valid in all dimensions. So gravitational Gauss law is valid in all dimensions. So the potential in any dimension, but then the del square will increase, so the dimension of the potentials will increase. To match the dimensions, I have to say the dimensions of the Newton coupling constant. So this also has to be modified. Okay. This potential dimension is just like if you put uh, volume, it just gives me n by r. What is the mass enclosed in that thing divided by its volume essentially. So precisely this is what, but then G contains some 
units of length and time, uh, length, time and plan. So when you are changing the potential length, potential units, because potential units changes as the length changes essentially. As you change in dimensions, exactly <coughs> like in electromagnetic theory, so this increases by one unit of for every extra dimension, it increases by one unit. The potential changes dimensions. So this since the potential changes dimensions. You have to compensate the dimensions by changing the Newton's coupling constant in dimensions. Okay? Newton's coupling constant also will change in dimensions because the force law also will change with the dimensions. So everything changes with dimensions. Okay? You cannot see it in the force law, you can only see it in potentials. Okay? So gm1 m1 m by r square. You won't know the uh, meaning. You won't see the effect of the, uh, uh, the. It's only the radial distance. It could be in any dimensions. X one plus versus two squares. But if you want to see the effect of the, uh, the volume effect, you have to see only the Gaussian. That's the reason why you need to. Suppose you are writing this force in any dimension. Actually, R will change. R will change because of the derivatives, right? Essentially, suppose you are writing a particle in G one into by R square. Okay, G will change because it's just the radial distance. R is equal to x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square plus x3 square. But when you are doing the electromagnetic thing, yes, you yeah. But they, they are just no need of G or the dimension you can see as a factor. Yeah, I meaning the derivative will change. No, it's, you are just taking the derivative with respect to the potential. That's it. It's only the radial distance. Its, a, its length will change, of course, but of course, the number of units will change. Yeah. G will change. But how do you argue that G will change? It is, it will definitely change, G will change in higher dimensions. G will definitely change, but to want to argue that how G will change, to see the volume effect, it is better to see in terms of the potentials, right? Uh -huh. Rather than directly in terms of forces. Uh -huh. So if you write potential at any dimension, I did the force is greater than This will change, D minus 1. So R will change to R D minus 1, but G, G, G should not change there, right? But you take the derivative of that essentially. G should change, right? So that is the change is, uh, from the volume factor, like last time we uh, do the exactly yeah. for electromagnetic theory, right? Yeah. Why G should not change? That's what I'm saying. Okay, okay let's do what is G. Hmm. Okay, then we'll see. Essentially. So G is G. Um, uh, so what are the units of G? Tell me. Mass. Mass Q L square minus two P minus two D. Just check. Uh, mass. Okay. M minus one L three P minus two. M minus one L three P minus two. Not M minus one. M minus two, no. It should be M minus two. No, M minus 1 maybe, yes, yes, you are right. M minus 2, M minus 1? M minus 1, L3, T minus 2. L3, T minus 2. Okay. Is this correct? Okay, I can just check that too. Yeah, that's right. Okay, this is correct. Now as you change the dimensions, how do you argue from here that uh, this has to change? Then L changes, right? It's much easier to see what is that. If you want to compute what is the effect, 
it's much easier to see in terms of the potentials rather than from the force directly. G is not, the point is G is not a constant, uh, so if L changes, how, how are you going to argue that L changes essentially? From here. R changes. Huh? Pardon? The radial changes. R. The quantum dimension R will No, it's a, see, you can always go to coordinate basis where it's only R, right? It's a center force. So you can always move it to a one body force. What we do in classical mechanics, in any gravitational potential. Okay? You only care about uh, line between joining the two masses essentially. It just reduces it to one dimensional force. So you don't see the anything of the line, it's only the line connecting the two masses. Right, exactly. So only the uh, what do you call the, the the length factor between them. So how many dimensions? It doesn't matter whether it's a three-dimensional problem is reduced to a two-dimensional problem essentially. So if you want to see the effect of the volume, the best way is to see through the potentials, not through the forces. Or we'll change the curve. Just like with electromagnetic force. I don't know if you have, I'm convinced you or not that. Yeah, actually, in electromagnetic field also, there will be a constant like permittivity. Yeah, permittivity will be there. They are also dimensional for constants, essentially. Uh -huh. so okay. But we set all of them uh, so to equal it to the speed of light, essentially. Yeah. In vacuum, mm -hmm. okay, in matter, it changes, definitely changes. In vacuum, it's equivalent to the speed of light, right? 1 by c square essentially. So, in so root of mu 0, so 0 is equal to c square. So, the only thing which is constant is Planck's constant and speed of light are not changing with extra dimensions. Okay, in vacuum. No, no, it's also <laughs> no, but Newtonian gravity in the sense that uh, at the end of the day, when you write the Einstein Hilbert action, even for general gravity, what six is in, instead of gn, gn is equal to we were equated with respect to m Planck square. So it is equivalent to the Planck's constant. But it's easiest to see in terms of gravitational potential. We can do it for the full uh, general relativity also. But it's easier to see it for Newtonian gravity. So you can do it for gravitational potentials in general relativity also. That's not a problem with Einstein's equation. But it's easier to see with the weak Einstein gravity. With these weak, weak, weak Einstein gravity also. Things get modified if you have strong Einstein gravity. So if you have a cosmological constant and everything, um, it becomes much more complicated. Okay, so let me define a few things. Planck length and time. So Planck length LP. I in the mass like this is the scale at which quantum gravity will become important. Essentially, you just write down what are the units which give you in terms of length. This is a paper written by Planck. You can look at the paper essentially where the quantum effects become important. Okay. Then, this is around 10 power minus 33 centimeters. Okay. 
then TB is nothing but plant time LP by C. Step for minus 44 seconds. And plant mass this everybody knows this. We know it in terms of grams, uh, in terms of kgs and everything. So these are your scales, the fundamental scales at which quantum gravity effects will become important. Now what is the relation between this and this? The idea is that as g changes, as g changes, your plant length, everything will change. Okay? Your plant mass changes. So as you keep changing your g, you can bring down your plant mass all the way up to TV scales by putting in extra dimensions. By putting in extra dimensions. As you change your G, you change your plant mass. So higher dimension of G the value. In higher dimension the value of G increases. In higher dimensions the value of G will change. It will increase. We want to decrease the dimension, right? No, actually what you do is uh, you want to reduce the volume because of the volume factor G will actually, okay, M plank will reduce, okay, M plank will reduce. So M plank will reduce means what G will increase. And it becomes uh, strong enough. So gravity, which is supposed to be weak, will become strong at the weak scale. So it becomes strong at the weak scale. So it's supposed to be weak at uh, all the other forces will get reduced. Okay, gravity, which is supposed to be weak at uh, one TV scale, where these effects are not supposed to be felt, these its effects will start being felt so much so that you should be able to see it at uh, the collapse. Okay. So that's the reason why I call these theories as strongly coupled theories because they have large couplings essentially. So now let's do a comparison by what happens to uh, G5 in various dimensions. Uh, okay, this is what about compare compactification. So at every dimension, at every dimension, so what happens is, so you have increase in one length essentially. So in general, you have the Poisson's equation that square B of D is equal to 4 pi G of D rho matter.
So at every dimension, again you increase by one unit of length. So if you have g5 m by l power 4 in four dimensions, you will have five dimensions in four dimensions m by l cube. So one unit of length okay, of each come. This is just coming from this equation essentially. This is just coming from this equation. So d5, again same thing, same thing which we are using for, uh, for the case of uh, uh, the, like in the EF case. I remove this thing. So, because the row volume will have an extra L factor essentially sitting here, okay. So, G M by L by 4, whereas in 4 dimensions we have L cube essentially, same thing. So, if you take G5 by G4, it is roughly scaling by a factor L4, L4 by L cube, so essentially it's scaling by a factor L. One unit length difference for each extra branch. So in general, you can write it uh, okay. in this manner. So essentially, if your gn changes, your gravitational length is nothing but gn is 1 by n plan square, okay. 1 by n plan square, I replaced 1 by n plan square. formula so far has, I have not done anything new, I have just replaced the potential by this particular thing, I have not done anything new, okay. N is the number of extra dimensions, but the only thing I introduced is 4 dimensions plus N is the number of extra dimensions, okay. So if I, N is equal to 0, I get GL M1 M by R square, 
r. n is equal to 0 is 4 dimensions. n is equal to 0 is 4 dimensional field. Now what I am going to say is that these n dimensions are going to be compactified. What is compactified? Because you cannot have all these dimensions completely infinite. Okay? Are not going to be infinite. I'm dismissing the up to here I have not used any compactification. So you can have six dimensions, all of them are completely see, six extra dimensions. So you see that your M plank in eight dimensions will be completely different compared to your standard thing because there is say another uh, uh, another volume factor coming from here. I'll write in terms of volume factors or radio factors. So this will be some r power 7. So in string theory, you have how many? 6 extra dimensions. Because string theory, super string theory is in 10 dimensions. Okay? Super string theory is, so you have n is equal to 6. So n is equal to 6. So what do you have? So v of r is equal to m1, m2, m plan. N one by R times. So if the range is equal to six, this is super string theory in ten dimensions. Now the, the point is that here is a thing. Now you, you don't want all this uh, extra dimensions to spoil your things. Okay? You don't want all this extra dimension to spoil. Them. So what you choose is the scale of the extra dimension to be very, very small. That means the compact. So what you say is these extra dimensions should not satisfy, I mean, they don't have any evidence for this. So they should curl to themselves. Okay? They should curl to themselves. So how do you do this? This is the old Caruso plan theory in which this extra dimension y, so this y is radial compact to itself. Y is equal to 0, y is equal to 5. Now you identify y is equal to 0, y is equal to 2 pi. So essentially this just becomes some radius r. So suppose if you say y is equal to y at 0 is equal to y plus 2 pi r. Essentially, you are identifying this point after the circle. So it is no longer 
it's no longer an infinite extra dimension. Okay, it is an extra dimension which is curling up to itself. It's a circle. This extra dimension is a circle. So this is just an equation for circle. Y is equal to zero is equal to y is equal to two pi of the radius. Do you all agree with this? That y is equal to zero is equal to y is equal to two pi. Okay, y is equal to zero to two y is equal to two pi. Now this is a periodic boundary condition. If you if you write any function on a periodic boundary condition, what happens? It gives you cos s and sin s. That we'll see. So that means this extra dimension has a radius r, with a small radius r. It turns out, if all these radius are of the Planck scale, if all the radii are of the Planck scale, okay, if the other radii are around equal to, if all radii. Are close to L P. If all radii are close to L P, length of the Planck scale, you don't change M Planck in D dimensions is roughly equivalent to M Planck in four dimensions. Can put the numbers, okay? Okay, in terms of the Planck scales, essentially you can write it down. <coughs> so this is what happens in string theory. So all the radii are very close to the Planck scale, so we don't really see any effect of them, okay? So that is the original idea of superstring theory that we have all the radii are very very small. So your Planck scale in B dimensions, so 10 dimensional Planck scale is roughly the same as the 4 dimensional Planck scale. So it won't really modify your, okay, your volume. The volume effect because of this large compact fit, all the six dimensions could be compactified, but this compactification dimension is very close to the uh, Length of the Planck scale essentially. If the radii are all essentially length of the Planck scale essentially. Okay? So in that case, you don't really modify it. So if you want the general formula for the Planck scale, you can just write it down here. So m Planck square in four dimensions is equal to m Planck in four plus m two plus M R power. R is this radius. R is this radius. Y is the uh, x four. So five dimensions. So let's just take x x. Uh, five dimensions as x four and y as the fifth dimension. Okay, x mu is your normal four dimension, zero plus x y z t, okay, or x y z t, and then fifth dimension is typically denoted by y. Okay, and this y is not as y is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity, but it is zero to two pi r. It's a circle. It's a circle. Now, if you take so it's a circle of radius r. So you see that the Planck scale changes. This is just from this formula, essentially. This is just from this formula. Equating with four dimensions and everything, you can just get it. And you take the extra n dimensions here are all equivalent to same r. All the extra dimensions are all equivalent to same r, meaning they're all compacted with the same r dimensions. Length of r. And you have this formula. In this formula, let's just take n is equal to 6, say for example, 6 dimension Planck scale, and then put r is equal to L Planck. So you see that 4 dimension Planck scale and this one will not be, will not be significant. 
Okay, they don't get modified because m power six and r power six are same, so they cancel with each other. Okay, m power six and r power six are roughly of the same order. Okay, and they cancel with each other. So what you are left with m prime square is called m prime square. So if we want to construct by adding extra dimension, you cannot reduce the bending. You can reduce if you take R much, 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 much larger than M blank. You can reduce. That's the idea of extra dimensions. So what you call extra dimensions? Extra dimensions have been there since the 1980s in string theory. But most of them always considered this condition, where R is equal to very close to L. But in the early 1990s, okay, people found solutions of superstring theories in which there is a type of string theory. Some solutions of string theory in which R can be very very large. And of course, then Dwali, Dimopoulos, and Arkanyama threw that idea out and let's say independent of string theory, we can write gravitational theories to solve hierarchy problem. Okay? By increasing R. By increasing R. If you don't increase R, as you have said, you cannot you won't change anything. Okay. So suppose if I want M prime M prime uh, in two plus one or two plus uh, say for example n is equal to four n is equal to one let's just say n is equal to one four plus one R is equivalent to 1 T. That's what I want. I'm just setting it and I am solving it for R. Solve for R. And this R comes out to be 10 for 7 kilometers. <coughs> this is ruled out. Why it's ruled out? Because you have measured gravitational potential Cavendish experiments and so on experiments very accurately. Okay, you measure, measure the Newton's constant. This spoils sun at the distance. This spoils everything essentially. So this is we cannot modify Newton's gravity <laughs> at this large distances. Okay. It turned out that Newton's gravity law has been well measured up to one, one millimeter essentially. It has been measured very well up to one millimeter So the minimum you have to choose is n is equal to two. And you see, because it's power law, it significantly modifies. R comes out to be around 10 power minus 2 to 10 power minus 3. Ten power minus 3, I think, if I remove that. Centimeters. Uh, <coughs> yeah, 100 micrometers to 10 power. So this you can use. So if you have millimeter scale, very large extra dimensions, very large extra dimensions, okay, that means Newton's gravity is also very, very large. So it's around 1 TeV, meaning you have very strong gravity. If you have very large extra dimensions, you can bring down the Planck scale all the way up to T. But 
I'll tell you, I'll uh, put up a review on uh, the latest experiments actually. Since this proposal has been there, there are a lot of experiments trying to measure, you know, the Oetos experiment, when you measure the Newton's law uh, thing, not Oetos, the sort of the Cavendish. Exactly like the Cavendish, American draw oil drop experiment, you also have similar thing for gravitational things. Okay? You measure the Newton's uh, gravitational potential between two masses at very, very, very close temperature, at very, very close distances, around one millimeter or so on. So, so this has been done very well, and there have been a significant improvement on this experiment. I'll put, give you a latest review. I'll put it up on the two pages. So these are called Arcani Hemmer Dimo Polo. Bali models or also called ADD models or also called large experiments. So this came out in nineteen ninety nine. In nineteen ninety one, actually from super string theory. Ignatius Antonio Addis pointed out that it is possible in type 1 string theory that you can bring down the string scale all the way up to 1 to Okay, but this is in super string theory and everything. But these people completely different. Okay, Antonio Addis was very similar idea. String scale. From Planck down to TGB. These are four dimensional string theory. So, some sort, some sort of string, critical strings actually you can read them. Okay. I'm, you cannot get the original papers. I wanted to put the original papers on the archive, but I, uh, on the team's page, but I couldn't get this original paper. But you can have it uh, somewhat in uh, proceedings or something. Okay. But these people, they don't have super string theory, they don't have anything. ADD just says that I am solving the hierarchy problem. Okay. I don't care about super string theory, I don't care about quantum gravity, I don't care about anything. I am just solving the hierarchy problem by proposing large extra dimensions and bringing down the Planck scale all the way. Okay, so that was a revolution at that time, essentially. So that okay. So the next step, so we solved the problem that we can bring down the flat scale down to the EV scale just by using the Bloch's law in higher dimensions. Okay, you are all convinced that you can bring it down. Okay, yeah. so just by using the Bloch's law. Okay. Now the next step is how are we going to put? Fermions and gauge fields onto this extra. So, okay. So that we will do in the next class.